Hallelujah. Ah, God's good. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> We've been talking about authority and power. Police officer. What's this? <laughs> That's the authority. That's the exosia. What's this? The deutimus. This is the enforcer of this. And so it's important that we understand who we are in Christ, that we have the deutimus power of the Holy Spirit, but the authority because we are the sons of God. And we're walking in that relationship with the Father because authority comes from relationship. And so, so as, as a king would give to his prince or those that, that would be in his kingdom, he would delegate his authority and they would speak on behalf of the king. So that's what we are. We are the sons of God and we speak on behalf of the king. And it's important, as, as we know, is... is, is it's, a, it's about relationship. Authority always flows out of relationship. And so it's not just having a title, it's a relationship. And that's what we're going to look at today. The tale of two kings, the source of their authority. <clears throat> what is the attitude of my heart? Have you probably noticed in my ministry, I talk a lot about the heart. Because that's what this is all about. And we're going to see this today. Your attitude determines your altitude. Where you go determines the attitude of your heart. True authority comes from the attitude of your heart. Because God is looking at your heart. You could have the Bible memorized from front to back, but if your attitude stinks, you're not going to be anything. Because God's not going to instill his authority into you because you stink. It's, we get our heart right with the authority that's been entrusted to us, and we flow in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Attitude, a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. Typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. Determine a person's behavior by their conduct. I do that a lot with some politicians out there. I don't trust them. I don't care what comes out of their mouth. I don't trust them. Because their behavior says something that's totally different. Chuck Swindoll said the, the remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we will embrace for that day. What attitude will we have this day? I like Watchman Nee. If you've ever read The Spiritual Authority with Watchman Nee, that's one of the first books that I had ever read on spiritual authority. Is, it's when a believer has crossed into the domain of the spiritual, he daily ought to maintain a combat attitude in the spirit, praying therewith for the overthrow of all the works of Satan done through the evil powers. The attitude of our heart every day, should we wake up as a warrior? We have a heart of a warrior. So in the tale of two kings that we're going to look at here is the tale of Saul and David. The difference in their kingdom. Israel demanded a king. That's my ring, so I thought it was mine there for a moment. <laughs> That's okay. Israel demanded a king. And uh, 
1 Samuel 8. And they wanted to have king, a king, a little king, like everybody else has. God being their king was not good enough for them. So in Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 8 says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in that they say to you, For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You know, it's like, it's hard to imagine. Here, God of the universe wants to be your king, but you're not good enough. So the first king was Saul. God picked Saul because he knew the hearts of the people. He knew what they wanted. They wanted a, a king that, uh, this big guy, doesn't, I don't care what's going on in his heart, but we just want this big guy. First Samuel 9, 1, through, 1 and 2 says, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zoro. <laughs> the son of Bacurath, the son of Aphid, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 we have some new people here. You don't know that, that I haven't shared this, this story, but it's, it's a true story. I have dyslexia, if, if you haven't noticed that. And I hated school when the teacher, we'd get in a circle and have to read. To me, that was the most nightmarish thing in the world for me. And I went one summer, they were trying to train my eyes, and they were trying to do all this kind of stuff, and words scramble, and sentences scramble, and, I, and, uh, and so... Uh, on the yearly aptitude test, or whenever they would do that at certain grades, uh, I would, mechanical reasoning, and I was the 95 percentile. English, 5 percentile. So my forte is not English. Not reading. And so here, now God says, I want you to read in front of people. So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Because when the Lord asked me to do this, I said, Lord, I have dyslexia. I just, I, I'm not into words. I, tell me to structure a sentence, I'm lost. I know what a noun and a verb is. That's about it. But structuring a sentence, but you want me to build something? I'll build this, whatever you want. Whether it's out of steel or wood or concrete, whatever, I can do that. But structure a sentence, okay. These names, <laughs> But here, okay, back. Uh, a Benjaminite, a mighty man of power. So this is Kish, Fish, Kish, whatever I guess. The father of Saul. Okay, now I want to focus this because this is Kish and it tells his lineage. And he was a mighty man of power. You got that? Mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulder upward, he was taller than all other people. So he was this, everybody else was here down. So this was the, the, the guy that, that, that he, God knew this is what they wanted. They wanted a big guy from this lineage that he, this Cush guy, this uh, Cush guy, is a mighty man. So he has a reputation. But Saul had a problem. He didn't see himself that way. So this is what he said in First Samuel nine twenty one, and Saul answered and said, "Am I not a Benjaminite?" of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family, the least of all the families of the tribes of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? 
where was where was Saul's head? We just, we just see here that his dad was a mighty man. He had to be well known. But Saul didn't see himself that way. And that he's the least family and he is the least person. Your self-image will determine your altitude. What you see yourself will determine where you go in life, whether it's in the natural, at the spiritual, or where. <clears throat> In verse 21, or uh, verse 10, 21, 22, I'm going to read that. When Saul was being recognized before the people, you can, go, you can read this later, they were looking for Saul and he had hid himself among the equipment. Here's this big guy you would think would be coming out there like Hoss Cartwright. <laughs> you younger people don't know who that is. And he's a big guy, and he'll bust some heads and all this kind of snow, but he's hiding over in the equipment. God knew this man and what the people wanted king. They wanted a big guy. Well, you got a big guy. Amen. But he's a mouse. So in 1 Samuel 10, 23 and 24, it says, And so they ran and bought him from, uh, brought him from there, the, out of the, the equipment, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people, and his sh- shoulder upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? God chose him because that's what they wanted. They wouldn't have been satisfied anybody else, but that's what they wanted. You're going to get what you want. God will at times allow you to get what you want. And not what is best for you. He will let you go after what you want. So you will face the consequences of what you want. Rather than spending time in God. God, what do you want for me? What do you want for my family? Saul did not obey God. He, <clears throat> he ordered uh, the destruction of the Malachites. Uh, he did a lot of different things. You, you got to read the story. I don't want to read all of that. But in, in 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 12, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And he grieved Sam, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Then uh, verses 22 through 23. So Samuel said, "Has the Lord as, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices?" as to obey the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you as king. Because he was doing his own thing. He didn't observe uh, what Samuel said. He was doing his, Saul was doing his own thing. So Saul cared more about his reputation with the people than he did about God. Because then in, in uh, verse 15, 30, 31, it said, Then he said to, uh, to the prophet, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Please, before the elders of the people, and behold Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Everywhere Saul recognizes and speaks of the Lord, he says, your God. He never refers to God, his God, my God. He never does. 
And so Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. So Saul also spoke of your God. What does the Lord look for in a leader? That's what we want to look. That's what we want to know is what God. What does God really look for? And what and the downfall of Saul's kingdom? He didn't have a heart after God. Number one, he didn't pray to God. He didn't have a relationship with God. He had nothing in recognition. All he had was stature, and that stature he didn't have anything else. The downfall of Saul was disobedience, rebellion, and self-will and pride. Where do you think most thing people fall is in these categories? Disobedience, rebellion, self-will, and pride. So God raises up a second king for Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. This is Saul. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So David was a man after God's heart. Acts 13, uh, 22 and 23, And when he had removed him, he raised Saul, he raised, uh, raised up for them David, a king, to whom also... He gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. So here we can see a contrast now of one leader who was more concerned about himself, more concerned about his prestige, more concerned about his gain, Sounds like a few politicians I know today. They're more concerned about themselves than the people they represent. Then we can see this in business. An owner of a company who's more concerned about himself than he is the people. You take care of the people, you don't have to worry about where the company goes. But if you take care of yourself, you lose the people. And the church, if the church is if the church is built about me and about what I can get and what I can become and what I can get promoted in a denomination, well, I'm not in a denomination, but how many are there looking? I know pastors they're moving up the corporate ladder. So who are they really there for? David was the smallest and the youngest of his father's house. You can read the story. I'm just going to hit some highlights here. David was a shepherd for his father. He was the youngest, and he was a shepherd. We know that he uh, was not a hireling. Why? Because when the lion and the bear attacked, he killed them. He didn't run away. A hireling would run away. I'm not going to risk my life for those sheep. Those are your sheep. They're not my sheep. But he lived with those sheep. He knew those sheep. He probably had names for all of them. He played his instruments for them. They were personal to him. Yeah, they were my father's sheep, but no, they're mine. And that's what I've I've shared it. My heart is a pastor. I want to pastor a church of my best friends. Not attenders to the church. But we're all best friends. We're all family. We love one another. We'll die for one another. Because we care about one another. And that's where David was. They they were his father's sheep, yes. But he was willing to lay down his life to protect those sheep. David was anointed to be king by by Samuel <clears throat> while Saul was uh, still king. So God rejected Saul, and so God says, I have another. And so he goes to Jesse's house, and he brings out all of his big sons that are part of the military, all this kind of stuff. 
The oldest was the biggest guy. He was probably another Saul. And so they bring out all these guys, and, and, and Samuel says, none of these. You've you got to have another one. Well, yeah, he's my little guy out in the field. <laughs> well, get him. They get him, and this is him. David was anointed to be king in 1 Samuel 16, 13. Just because a person has an anointing does not mean that they are ready to walk in the fullness of that anointing. There are people that have anointing, but God is maturing it and developing into you. That's what happened with David. He was anointed, but he had to develop God had to do some work into him before it came about. They must be proven and tested. The difference between Saul and David was Saul saw himself as a victim. David saw himself as a victor. What happens, a leadership characteristic will permeate through the whole of the army, the whole of the church, the whole of the business, or whatever it is, all the whole of the government. I got to be careful. I don't want to get edited. But Mr. T, when Mr. T was the head of uh, this national organization, what was the difference? He was a man who had paid a price, a man who had a reputation. Now tell me, after how many years of investigation, they have not found any one thing other than lies, who built his empire in the biggest city in our nation, who is run by the mob. All the the mafias are there. And to come through it and not have anything that they could nail him to. He paid a price. He's always, and everybody that works for him, loved working for his resorts, for his businesses. And he will come up, uh, I heard Rush Limbaugh told told this one day, he said, before he passed away, he said, I was playing golf with him on a golf course. We were driving down, and there was a guy raking out uh, one of the, sand traps he said well, just a minute he pulled over there got out shook the guy's hand by and called him by name house your wife by name the children by name he knew everybody's name who worked for him and their families why do you think god picked him and the world wants to destroy him because he was a david He was a David. Now, is he perfect? Was David perfect? Am I perfect? Are you perfect? No. So let's we just kind of get that out of the window. You know, it's it's not about being perfect. It's being who God called you to be. And so, uh, because Saul saw himself as a victim, his army saw themselves as victims. So here Goliath is out there and everyone in his army is paralyzed because Saul is paralyzed in his tent. Here's the, he's a monster of himself is a monster of a guy. He should have been going out and, and, and take him on. But because their captain, their leader was afraid, the whole army was afraid. You need to read these stories, and when I read these stories, I try to enter into it and and visualize and see and experience what they're doing, what they're feeling, the emotion that's going on in this story, not just read it as a story. That's a nice story. They're given to us for us to dissect what is really going on in that environment. And so, because... Saul was paralyzed, the army was paralyzed. The attitude of the leader affects the whole of the army. The attitude of the 
president of the company will affect the whole. It's just whatever we do, the leader will set the stage for what's going on. 1 Samuel 17, 11. When Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They had no relationship with God. They were standing there in their own strength. Well, yeah, if you're standing there in your own strength before Goliath, you probably ought to be afraid. There's some Goliaths coming at us in the world today. If we're standing in our own strength, we're going to be afraid. And we will get the snot kicked out of us. But is that the attitude that we want? Saul was, was no high, uh, no higher, has, Saul had no higher authority than himself. See, when you're the top guy and everything comes right to here, there's nothing above it. He had no relationship above it. He had no relationship with God. He told Samuel to pray to your God again. It was never his God, your God. David had a higher authority, the Lord God Almighty. He knew who God was and is, and he, had, he was under his authority. David saw the army as victorious, and nothing on earth could stop them. They are the army of the Most High. Saul saw them as a, just an army, a physical army, but God, David saw them, no, this is the army of God. Yes. David knew that he could take Goliath because God was with him. Let's see. Oh, man, I, want, I'd like to, uh, I just want to read you this story. Even though I've got sucks, I'm going to read it. Because this is, this is so powerful to, to, to enter into this vision. Lord, help me. So David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took, took the things and went, to, went as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and to shout for battle. So that's all they were doing was shouting back and forth across the canyon. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies with the handlers of the supply keepers, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. And then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up from the army of the Philistines, and he stood according to these words, said according, spoke according to these words. So David heard them, and all of the men of Israel when they saw the man fled from him and were dreadful afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, with <clears throat> will give him his daughter, and give him his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who spoke by, uh, by him, saying, What shall be done to this man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now Eleb, his oldest brother, heard when he had spoken to the men, and Eleb's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? With whom have you left the few sheep in the wilderness? I knew your pride and your insolence of your heart. Now who really had the pride and the insolence of heart? His brother. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Sound like a brother, right? 
Is there no cause? Then he turned from him toward the others and said the same thing. And these people answered him on as the first did. Now what is it I'm going to get? Verse 31, And now, when the word which David spoke was heard, it was reported to Saul. And he said to him, Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Some say he was 12, 15, 16 feet tall. And David may be five foot tall. In the natural, that's not, that's not a, a, a match. Then David said to Saul, Let this man's heart, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth. He is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping father's sheep, my father's sheep. And when a lion and a bear came and took the lambs out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. He was proven. He was battle tested. Struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught it by his beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. See, he has defiled the armies of the living God. His perspective was totally different. You're not just attacking the army, you're attacking God. And that's not going to stand up. And we're not going to stand up and see God's house trampled down by this society and the culture. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivers me from the paws of the lion and from the paws of the bear, he will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, the Lord be with you. And we know he did. I loved my grandma's old, old Bible. And it shows David standing on top of Goliath holding up his head. He took his head off. And don't think there's an adversary in the culture today that is more powerful than God. God is allowing them to expose who they really are. They're exposing their corruption. They're exposing the, the demonic forces behind them. And so should we be afraid of them? No. No. The foundation we build on will determine our outcome. What you build your life on, what you build your family on, what you build your business on, what you build your career on, what you build in the, your church on will determine the outcome. Amen. And there are some churches that are waking up. At least there are some people in churches that are waking up. But there's got to be more than just attending church. Attend church one day and that, oh, well, I did my religious thing. Well, you're not going to slay any Goliaths with that attitude. That's right. no, you're not. Every morning you've got to get up and do spiritual warfare yeah. and fight. That's good. And fight for the life of your children, your grandchildren, yeah. for your community, for your, yeah. the church community, for the body of Christ. Yeah. David's authority was based on his relationship with the Lord. He... <clears throat> He left the outcome to God. I'll do my part, God, you do your part. Now thinking, here's a shepherd boy, and when we talk about a slingshot, it's not the kind we, you know, it's... Out in the wilderness, watching sheep, day after day, year after year, 
How many thing, times do you think he slung a rock? For just entertainment. I think you could take an eye out of a sparrow, flying. So if we want to, th- to, to step up and fight this battle, we've got to be practicing. We have to be digging into the Word. We have to know the Word. We have to know. And when opportunity comes to pray, yeah, let's pray. And we engage, and we pray, and we pray. A lot of times we don't see anything, but we keep praying. We keep doing it because we're, we're practicing. We're practicing. And someday somebody might come in and they're totally, totally demonically possessed. Those that haven't been practicing, ah, what do we do, what do we do? They become the army of Saul. Or somebody comes to the door and manifests the security guards or whoever's out there. Here, we'll just take care of it. In the name of Jesus, out of here. You can't come in this building. This person could come, but you can't, demon, get out of here. And we dealt with it at the door. David's authority was based upon his relationship. Psalms 17, 45 through 47. And then David said to the Philistine, You have come to me with sword and with spear and with javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. And what all the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It's not how powerful we become, it's how powerful our God is. And by the authority that we recognize, we enter into that authority and we speak with the authority of the Most High, just as he did. He made declaration. This is what's going to happen. David would not seek the throne of Israel. Even though he did this, he would not seek the throne of Israel until God gave it to him. There was a this scripture here in 24. This man said, now's the time. Now's the time to the throne. And so he goes out and he takes a piece of Saul's robe. And it grievously troubled him. How could I touch God's anointed? See, David had it. He, he, he took Saul, or Goliath. He took it. But it wasn't time for God to give it to him yet. He had to wait. And it grieved his heart that he touched God's anointed. God had to remove him. Because God set him in, God had to remove him. But David refused to be a rebel. Instead, he waited for God. Thus, we must learn that our obedience is more important than our works for God. Like David, we must learn to be subject to his authority before we can properly exercise our authority. We submit to his authority that we can execute that authority on the earth. Once one is placed in authority by God, then God and only God can remove them from their place. Years ago when I was studying about leadership, and when God puts you in position and stuff, there's a story that I read, a true story, 
and I forget what country it was in, but a pastor, God spoke to him and said, I want you to go over to another village and you need, there's something going on over there. I need you to go over to minister to them for 30 days. And so he said, Lord, so he had uh, three elders. He said, I'm going to be leaving. I'll leave the church with you guys. I'm going over there. So while he was over there, the three elders voted him out. And so someone went to him and said, Pastor, you've got to come back. You've got to come back. They voted you out. He said, if God put me in as pastor of that church, they cannot remove me. Amen. I will fulfill what God has called me here. And when I complete that, I will come back. One was hit by a car and died. One was, had a heart attack and died. And the other one was hit by a car. All three of them died. When God established, establishes us, you don't have to defend it. When God sets you in, whatever he sets you in, he sets you there and he is the only one that can remove you. There'll be those that will try to rise up, but who are they rising up against? See, that's what, that's what David recognized. He recognized, I, I can't touch Saul. That's, that's God and Saul. And so we need to be careful when, we, when we're dealing with spiritual authority. It is not something to take lightly. Amen. That it is something that we, we have to walk in the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, this is, this is your, I can't intervene on this situation. Amen. And so it's like, I don't say that because I see myself anything. I see myself as just a, one of you guys. But I know that God put me here. And I will be here as long as God wants me here. Amen. And when he doesn't want me here anymore, he will move me to something else. Yep. And stuff, and so I don't have to be afraid of somebody coming in and all this kind of stuff. My, because my responsibility is to, is to guard and protect you, yeah. and and to help us grow into the body of Christ, who we really are. Yeah. And like I've said before, I I will I am praying that you will do greater signs and wonders and miracles than I will. I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about us. The body of Christ. Oh, we got, you got to hear Pastor Dan. I, you know, the only reason I'm doing this right now is because there's an anointing on me and I can feel the anointing that's flowing through me. Talk to me later and I'll, I can't spell it. <laughs> it's because we're walking in the anointing in that moment in time. You have an anointing on your life. You have an anointing where you go, what you do, your business, your activities, and all that stuff. That Wherever you go, you are David's. And you'll say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that you're so scared of? I want to be David. Do you? The house of David's. You are, are you a victim or a victor? What authority are you under? Your authority will determine your attitude and your altitude. If your attitude is right with God, you will walk in authority and you will move mountains. The earth will shake under your feet. Not because of you, but because of the God that's inside of you and the authority that he's invested in you and he's developing you into. And some of you are just getting started into understanding who you really are in Christ. Because you know, Dan, we were designed to be giant killers. Every one of us. From the youngest to the oldest. There's giants out there. And they're, 
the world is waiting for giant killers. Do you want to be a giant killer? Do you want to be a giant killer? Let's stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Lord, I just pray right now. I pray the power of your Holy Spirit would just fall upon us, Lord. Lord, this is your word. It's not my word. This is your word. This is the word where you are taking all of us. Lord, I pray, Lord, that every one of us grab our hearts as you grab David's heart. And Lord, he's the little ruddy guy and he's just a little shepherd boy who was a giant killer. Lord, I pray right here, there's, there's some, some giant killers right here in maturing, developing in each one of us. Some of us have killed some giants. Some of us have not. But Lord, we will not be intimidated by this world. We will not be intimidated by what's going on in the political system. We will not be uh, affected by any of that because our government is not of this world. It is of your kingdom. We live in the United States, but our government is kingdom. And it's eternal. And that's who we are citizens of, of the eternal kingdom. And Lord, you are ruling and reigning in and through us. And so, Lord, I pray, take each one of us deeper into your presence, deeper into an understanding and the deeper fullness of what you have for each one of us. And Lord, I pray a, the spirit of boldness that would come upon us and not the spirit of fear. I rebuke the spirit of fear right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that, that our eyes are open to the opportunities before us to let our light shine to let our heart shine. Lord, let your glory shine in and through us to touch people one heart and one soul at a time. Lord, to bring forth the harvest, the harvest of people, Lord, that are hurting and that are dying. Lord, I pray, take us deeper. Take us deeper. We just give you praise and we want to worship you this morning. We just want to exalt you and lift you up because you are worthy of all our praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.